In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We fly to thy patronage, most holy Mother of God. Despise not our poor petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer our prayers. Amen. Our Lady of Walsingham, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wouldn't it be great to live in other times? The way we may feel at the moment, those other times may only be a few weeks ago. But we can look back at the past and we think, well, it, things were different. Well, things were always different in the past. But these are our times. And the challenges we face are the fate challenges of our generation. I spoke yesterday about living in the present moment. And what that means is that there is always a grace to be found in this moment. There is always God's presence to be found in this moment. There is the wisdom of God and the hope in God's promise that is to be found at this moment. We may learn from the past, yes, that's called wisdom. But that wisdom is there to help us to live today and to face the challenges of today. So how do we face the reality of our times? What's our intention to live today? Because this will determine our attitude towards today and it will influence what happens tomorrow. We all are, have our eyes on tomorrow coming out of the lockdown. What will our world look like? Well, the answer to that question will only be found when we get there. But when we get there, and the way we get there, and what sort of people we are like when we get there, will be determined by the way that we live today. And the way that we discover and embrace the grace of God. The older you get, the more you realise that in every event in life, God's grace is real and present. Now, when God chooses a woman or a man and entrusts them with a mission, now that mission may be marriage, a parent, a particular work of mercy, a work that changes the world, a contribution to their society. It may be a mission to be a priest or religious. There are some of you here who are taking part in this retreat or coming up to your ordination and your profession. There are some of you who have just got married or were planning to get married and your plans have been curtailed at the moment. But when God chooses us for a particular work in life, he starts by always making us a friend and a confidant. He brings us close to himself. If he asks us to do something, he will always give us the grace to do what he is asking of us. In Hosea we hear, Therefore I will now allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. From there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley a door of hope. There she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Before he sends someone forth, he calls them to the desert, like Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, and Jesus himself. Every dispatch to mission, every new start, is preceded by a call to the desert, a moment of retreat, when we step back and we look and we see, we don't run away, but we look and we see what God is asking of us. And we are tempted, in whatever it is that we are asked to do, to view these things in terms of a human mission. What can I do? What is it possible for me to do? to sort out this world, to sort out my parish, to sort out my family, to sort out my company, to sort out my neighbours. There is always a sense of a human mission and it's judged by our effectiveness and our success. 
When God entrusts us with a responsibility, our first response, our first response is, what can I do about it? Now, there is a remarkable story, which is the story of the beginning of Walsingham. And it starts with this woman, Richeldis, who is a good woman, the local lady of the manor, who has a great devotion to honour our Blessed Lady. She wants to do something to honour Our Lady. And when Our Lady appears to her, she takes her in spirit to Nazareth and she shows her the Holy House. This is the holy house of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. The holy house, sorry, of Joachim, Anne and Our Lady. And it's the place where Our Lady lived with her parents. And she said to her, I want you to build a replica of this house. And so here in Walsingham, Richeldis starts to build. She comes and she gets her builders together but nothing fits. The house doesn't fit together. They try all day and it in it's in, doesn't work. And so at the end of the day, they're very frustrated. The builders go home. But Richeldis prays for guidance. And in the morning, when they come back, our lady has built the house. Now there is such an important lesson for us. Whatever God is asking us to do, we start immediately putting things together, trying to make things fit. But it's only God who is the builder. It's only God, if we cooperate with him, that we can build what God wants us to build in our lives and in our world. But what happens is because we go to our own talents first, it doesn't work and we feel overwhelmed. We feel as though it's all a bit too much. If we look at the prophet Jeremiah, he is sent as a prophet to the nations and he says, Lord, I don't know how to speak. I don't know what to do. I'm frightened of going. Jonah, with his fear and his pride, calls him to run away from what God is asking of him. He does not wish to go to Nineveh to preach repentance to the people as God has commanded him because they feel he feels they are his enemies and he's convinced that God will not carry out his threat to destroy the city. At the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Our Lady and informs her of God's will in her life, she's afraid. It says, and Mary was deeply troubled by these words. This sense of being overwhelmed with our own inadequacies about the things that we are called to do in our life is a common feeling. There is a radical difference between the scope of the task and our own feebleness and inadequacies. There's a big gap, a big gap. In the face of the challenges in life, the challenges in our family, in our marriage, in our parish, in our diocese, in our world, we can lose heart before the mountain of materialism, cynicism, evil, fear, the awareness of our own weaknesses, or as it's called, the apostasy of the people. The story of Elijah is a, a remarkable story that illustrates this point. It starts with him wanting to die. Pretty extreme. He himself, it says, went to a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. It's all too much. How many times have you said that? It's just all too much for me. But then the angel of the Lord appears to Elijah and touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. And he got up and ate and drank, 
Then he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. And at that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. This tells us very clearly that whatever it is God is going to call us to do, he will give us the strength to do it. Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Unless we eat of what God wishes to give us, it will be too much for us. We need the strength of the food, the food of the Eucharist. We need the food of God himself. This is my body. This is my blood. I give it to you. It's yours. And it's that strength that will give us what we need for the journey through the desert. Now, when the word of the Lord came to Elijah, he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am alone left. And they are seeking my life to take it away. So there's a very real challenge there. Now, that may not be our challenge. Of course, it's not our challenge. But there will be a challenge in our life where we think, I'm not sure what to do. How can I actually address this? And this is what God says to Elijah. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord your God is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And we might add, and after the fire, there was a virus, but the Lord was not in the virus. And after the fire, though, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard this, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then came a voice to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? In all the great controversies and storms and earthquakes and viruses, the Lord was not speaking. It was speaking in the silence. He was speaking in prayer. Elijah is at the end of his strength. People reject his preaching. And we're often in this same place. We sometimes we feel we've expended the limits of our human possibilities. And it's precisely at this moment that God takes us into the silence of the desert. To renew the friendship where we knew that we were loved by the Lord, where our hearts had been touched. It may well be that we look back at this time of isolation, our time in the desert. It will either be a time where the achievement of the desert will be that we've cleared out all of our cupboards. We've binged on every box set it's possible to watch. We've done the garden. We've painted the fence. But what have we done with our time? God has brought us into a desert, into a place of silence. If we look at our streets, if we look at our environment, there is silence there. The cars have stopped. The airplanes have nearly stopped. The places that were packed are empty and we are in silence. And it's in that silence, in that moment of retreat, that God speaks to his people. And it is there we will find the true treasure of the grace of God, this free gift of himself that he gives to us. And our hearts will be touched because where our heart is, there our treasure will be. We are faced with the fundamental truth 
of the spiritual life. That for us to truly understand the kingdom of God, we must have all those things that are of no consequence stripped away from us. St. Paul speaks powerfully when he says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast of the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and holiness and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so we are called to this desert. In a remarkable way, the whole world is called to this desert where we've moved out from what was normal into a place that we could never have expected and we stand almost naked with all those things that we would have taken for granted have been stripped away and we have to say what's in our heart what do we treasure what is most important and it's in our nothingness that God can begin to speak to us. Once all of our plans, you know, they say that, that phrase, you know, if you want to give God a good laugh, tell him your plans. Well, our plans for this, our plans for this, our plans for all these things, they are on hold. But God's plan is not on hold. God's plan is alive and active at this moment. And for us, we have to ask ourselves, what's truly in my heart? Is the will of God at the heart of who I am? Because if it is at the heart of who I am, I will begin in the midst of all this confusion, in the barrenness of the desert, to begin to understand, to begin to find a wisdom that all the distractions of life had stopped me finding for most of my life. Or even in those moments in our life when I came across it as a glimpse. It can be now more than just a glimpse. It can be more than just a holy passing moment. It can be a, pro pro a profound moment of conversion. And a conversion is always about conversion of heart. What is in our heart? If God is in our heart, our heart will speak to another heart. If God's heart speaks to us and touches our heart, then the power of God's heart in my heart will have an impact on others. It always does. But if in my heart there is just bitterness and anger and fear, if there is just in my heart resentment, if in my heart there is lack of forgiveness or my, an inability to say sorry, and how that's what I will pass on to somebody else. What is in my heart? At this moment in the desert, there is only one thing that can sustain us. And despite all the best efforts by government and volunteers and the NHS and all those wonderful people who are doing such remarkable things in the most impossible situations... The NHS might save our body, but only God can save our life. Our structures may keep us fed, but only God can give us the bread of life. What will keep us safe, what will give us life, can only be given to us by God. And so we want to sometimes run away we want to run away from this the parish the patron saint of um, secular priests is the cure of ours saint john vianney and he um, became the parish priest of a, a very small french village called ours 
And when he arrived, um, it was a very difficult parish. And he had a tough time of it. But he was a very, very holy man. And I remember, as a young seminarian, reading the life of the cure of ours. And it didn't really move me, because it seemed to be so extreme. He, he fasted all the time. He heard, conf- he heard millions of confessions in his lifetime. And I thought, I'm not sure I can connect with this, because it's so amazing. And then a few years ago, I went with a group of priests to ours. And as we drove into the village, there was um, the, the coach driver stopped and he got us out and he said, um, if you look over there, you'll see a cross. And we all looked and we said, yes, we can see it. He said, that's the cure's cross. And we looked and said, oh, very nice, yes. He said, look over there, you'll see another cross. There's another one of the cure's crosses. Yeah, right, that's two curious crosses, very nice. And he said, then look here, and this is the third. And we said, well, what's the significance of these crosses? He said, these crosses mark the place where the curé of ours ran away. It was all too much for him. And at that moment, I thought to myself, here's a man I could understand. How many times in our life have we want to run away? How many times do we want to run away because it seems too much for us? And if people like this great saint, then there is a, there is a resonance within us. But the reason he came back, because he always came back, was because of the love of his people, and because his belief in God. There are moments when we feel we are in the desert. There are, and this is one of them at the moment. There are moments when we want to run away. But it's in our weakness that will be our strength. Because our strength will not just be ours. It will be God's strength in me. It is not I that live but Christ that lives in me in the desert we enter into the mystery that God can make something out of nothing that's the great mystery of the desert it's the great mystery about me and you is that there is a moment when God can make something of us But we can't bring anything to the table. All our plans, all our ideas, all our anxieties, in some ways stop us from receiving what God wants to give us. And it's at moments on retreat, at moments on the desert, when we step away from those things that block us from this pure, unconditional love of God that suddenly God can make something out of nothing I can't take it with me I can't take anything with me as I said the other day when you die you can't take anything with you all those things that have been so precious to us all those things that we've collected all those things that we've hankered after all those things we've desired can't take any of it except for one thing that which has been turned into love in my life, that I take with me. That comes from nothing, because the love that I have, I've not earned. It's unconditional. God doesn't say to me, I will love you if. He just says, I love you. From that, he can make something out of us. So wherever we are, whether we are at home, whether we are sick, whether we are in hospital, whether we are in prison, wherever we may be, God's unconditional love can free us. But we have to make sure that we don't bring our own plans to the meeting. 
that we come with our arms open, ready to receive whatever the Lord wishes to make of us. This is our desert. This is the silence. This is our retreat. For it is in this place we enter into the mystery of the God who makes something out of nothing. The God who makes someone a friend. And that friend is you and me with our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mass will be at 12 o'clock.